you. I will uh, start sharing here. I'm a little technologically challenged, so I always seem to struggle. Um, but hopefully, okay, are you seeing my? Yep, you're good. There? Oops, okay, sorry, I just wanna move this. There we go, okay. All right, well, thank you uh, for that introduction, Jason. So for those of you who um, haven't met me or don't know me, I'm uh, Danielle Schmier and I'm the uh, infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist in Saskatoon. I thought um, I was asked to present. And so I thought, you know what, maybe I will just give a, a little bit of an update on what we see here in Saskatoon in terms of our antibiograms and a comment on some trends that we're seeing. Um, and yeah, we'll go from there. Okay, isn't that working? There we go. Okay, so before delving into the presentation, here are the Saskatchewan Health Authority's uh, vision, mission, values, and philosophy of care. And of course, acknowledging, acknowledging um, our treaty land acknowledgement. Um, we're gathering here across the province from many different areas um, and gathering on treaties two, four, five, six, eight, and 10. Okay, so the presentation today, so um, to start off, I'll just do a brief, um, very novice overview of like of what an antibiogram is. I'm sure most everyone here already knows, but I thought I'd just uh, do a little um, overview of what an antibiogram is and kind of the guidelines that we use for developing them or, or what we do here in Saskatoon anyway. And then from there, I'll go into talking about some trends that we see in um, in Saskatoon and what we saw over this past year. And then time permitting, I'll pass the ball over to Jason and he'll talk a little bit about potentially the future of our Saskatchewan antibiograms and AMR net. Okay, so what is an antibiogram? So basically an antibiogram, I'm sure most of us know this here already, is a cumulative report that um, lists the percentages of isolates susceptible to a variety of antibiotics. Um, from patients receiving care at a particular institution over a defined period of time. So where antibiograms are especially useful is, I mean, there's many different ways, especially from a stewardship perspective, but there's kind of two main um, um, purposes, I guess. The first is that they're useful in guiding empiric therapy. So if you have a patient, for example, who has an E. coli bacteremia and you don't have susceptibilities on it, you can look at your local antibiogram to say, okay, what would be the best choice for this patient based on our local resistance rates. And then second is that um, they're useful from a, like an antimicrobial stewardship program perspective in monitoring resistance trends over time. And then um, you can use targeted um, interventions to try to combat that resistance or slow that resistance um, trend down. There are the clinical and laboratory um, standards institute guidelines. I think the most recent is the M39 guideline. I actually don't have a copy of this document. I think it's a fairly large document, um, but I did take a course um, in, in, in a, a, it was a particular stewardship course that kind of gave me a brief overview of sort of the guidelines and rules that you're supposed to follow when developing an antibiogram. And so I thought we could just touch on a couple of those just um, to have some base knowledge about how your antibiograms are developed um, as, as it is useful, uh, useful information. Okay, sorry, I'm having trouble clicking here. I don't know why it's doing that again. Like I said, technologically, Challenged. Okay, there we go. So the CLSI M39 recommendations. I, I've pulled it, it's a, it's a large document, but I've pulled a few in that I thought would just be clinically relevant, sort of to talk about. So the first is that you're compiling um, and presenting your data at least annually. So here in Saskatoon, we do um, develop our antibiograms and publish them annually. Um, I know in Regina they do the same, and we're trying to work provincially. Um, across the province and supporting other of the other former health regions in, in doing so. The second is that you're only including diagnostic isolates, so not surveillance isolates. So those MRSA nasal swabs, those VRE surveillance swabs, those would be excluded. Uh, the third recommendation is that you're including only the first isolate um, per patient per reporting period. And this is just because if you continue to use multiple isolates from the same patient per 
first day, you'll start to see a resistance bias as they are exposed to antibiotics throughout their stay. Um, they're more likely to become resistant. So you can get what's kind of known as a resistance bias. And then that would result in more broader spectrum therapy being used empirically. Uh, the fourth point there that I have on the slide is that we really should only be reporting organisms with testing data of 30 or more isolates per reporting period. Obviously, the larger number of samples that you have, the more accurate the data is. And so the threshold, uh, the cutoff is essentially 30 isolates. In Saskatoon here, we do report on a few um, that are under the 30, 30 sample size just because we deem it to be relevant and it's the most, you know, it's the only information we have. And so we do report on a few and I'll, I'll comment on that throughout the presentation today. And then finally, another important um, point, especially as some of these newer antimicrobial agents are coming out, is that we're only supposed to uh, report susceptibility data for antimicrobial agents that are routinely tested, not selectively tested. Um, this is just because essentially if you report out on something that's been selectively tested, it's not representative of the overall subset of samples. Um, uh, like of, of your samples. So, for example, like with ceftolazone tazobactam, that's a newer um, anti pseudomonal agent that we use not frequently, but have had to use um, in Saskatoon here. We only selectively test it for specific uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates that are resistant to your first line agent. So, we wouldn't include that on an antibiogram because it would be a sample size of maybe 10 samples as opposed to um, the, the full. The full, um, the full sample size. And then there are other recommendations that are specific to certain organisms. For example, with Staph aureus, it's recommended that you report your total Staph aureus isolates so that people can see what percentage is MRSA and MSSA, and then you report your MRSA and MSSA separately. And then as well, another example would be, that's organism specific, would be Streptococcus pneumoniae. So it's recommended that you report both meningitic and non-meningitic breakpoints for penicillin and ceftriaxone. So those are kind of the summary of recommendations that we follow um, from the CLSI guidelines for developing our antibiograms in Saskatoon. Okay, so in Saskatoon, we're very fortunate. Um, we have the support that we're able to um, stratify our data from the lab by age by patient location and by infection type or sample type. So this actually results in Saskatoon having 14 antibiograms. Uh, we basically um, stratify by age first. We've got adult and pediatric uh, antibiograms, and then we stratify further by um, outpatient and inpatient, so community acquired versus hospital acquired infections. And then we look at both urinary isolates. So for example, if you're treating a, a UTI, you would look at that isolate versus, or that antibiogram versus a non-urinary isolate antibiogram that looks at all samples excluding your urine samples. So this would include your bloodstream, your respiratory, um, tissue samples, abscess aspirates, that sort of thing. So we have for urinary um, isolates, we have both an adult and pediatric antibiogram for both outpatient and inpatient. For non-urinary isolates, we have an adult and pediatric um, outpatient and inpatient antibiogram. We also look um, at critical care as well. So we have both a urinary and non-urinary antibiogram for our adult critical care population. We also have an inpatient respiratory uh, isolate antibiogram as well as a bloodstream isolate antibiogram. We have a long-term care urinary isolate antibiogram. And then we also have a, you know, I have adult inpatient candida bloodstream that actually I think is adult and peds data combined. So we have an inpatient candida bloodstream isolate antibiogram as well. So that's kind of a summary of our antibiograms and they can all be found on first line. Any of the antibiograms that are completed across the province um, are submitted, we submit them to first line and so you can find that information there. Okay, so with that being said, that's sort of a summary of how we develop them, what ours look like here in Saskatoon. Now let's talk about some trends. I don't like to be a pessimistic person, 
unfortunately, that's a bit of the talk today, but I'll start off with some good information, a little bit good, mostly good, actually, a little bit bad. Um, and then we'll delve into sort of the bad news bearers uh, information at the end. Okay, so first, you know, I thought I would just talk about our Canada bloodstream antibiogram. And that's because to my knowledge, and someone please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, I think this is the only um, antifungal antibiogram that we have here in the province. So I thought I would share it just as a reference so that people know if they want information on um, Canada species and antibiograms and what our susceptibilities look like here in Saskatoon, you could you could feel free to find this on um, on first line or on the SHA library. I do believe they exist there as well. So we actually use a three year composite to get an appropriate sample size. We obviously don't have a large enough sample size each year to um, get enough samples for it to be accurate. If you remember that 30 that um, sample size of 30 threshold. So we use a, a, a three-year composite to get an appropriate sample size. What I wanted to highlight here, I guess, is looking at our Elbacans um, data, we essentially have 100% susceptibility to fluconazole. So if I see a patient who has a candidemia and the organism is candida Elbacans without susceptibility data, I feel very confident in stepping that patient down to uh, fluconazole right away, permitting that the underlying disease state would, would, would deem that appropriate. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out is that Elbacan susceptibility, great to fluconazole. Um, Glabrata is um, our susceptibility. This would be for the susceptible dose dependent dose of fluconazole. Uh, we have about 90% susceptibility to fluconazole, which is also great. However, that does vary uh, from year to year. I believe a couple of years ago, we actually sat at around 75%. So if I have a patient who has glabrata in their blood, I would wait before stepping them down from caspo fungin to um, fluconazole, just because I do know our susceptibility rates do vary. At the bottom here, you can see here again, this is where we have that small sample size where technically we probably shouldn't be reporting this. Um, but again, sometimes some information is better than no information. So we did decide to report on these. Um, Crusi we include just because we know um, it's intrins intrinsically resistant to fluconazole. So we basically just have that on our antibiogram so that if somebody does have a patient with Crusi, they can look and see, oh, right, I can't use fluconazole regardless. So that is our Candida bloodstream antibiogram. Now we'll go on to another, uh, this isn't necessarily a trend, but it's, it's a positive note. And I thought it was um, something to think about. So I thought I would just present on this. So throughout this presentation, you'll see here, I refer to the the type of antibiogram at the top, and then the 2022 data in comparison to the 2023 data on top. And these slides are a bit busy. Hopefully I won't lose you. But so what I wanted to highlight here is that year across year across year, our ceftriaxone, our susceptibility of strep pneumo to ceftriaxone, whether it's meningitic breakpoints or non-meningitic breakpoints, are essentially 100%. So this is in the this would be a community acquired non urinary sample. So this might be bloodstream. This could be a rest sample. Um, so we are seeing basically 100% susceptibility to ceftriaxone, even at meningitic breakpoints. Okay. If you look at our inpatient setting, we say we see the same thing. So this would be hospital acquired. This is probably where you might see some CSF samples. Again, probably some bacteremia, some bloodstream samples. Again, basically 98 to 100% susceptibility. I looked across um, the province to see, okay, what are we seeing elsewhere? Regina reports the same thing. Prairie North, um, their 2022 antibiogram was 100% susceptibility as well to ceftriaxone from both meningitic and non-meningitic breakpoints. And same with Sunrise. So I present this not as a, it's, I guess it's a trend in that we always see nearly 100% susceptibility. Um, but it really raises the question of what is the value in adding vancomycin to our empiric menin meningitic regimen. We all know sort of the cocktail that everybody receives, ceftriaxone, vanco, plus or minus ampicillin based on age, maybe some acyclovir in there. But 
it really does raise the question of what is the value when we add vancomycin specifically for penicillin or ceftriaxone resistant strep pneumo. I know some other areas across Canada, because they see similar uh, susceptibility rates to us, they have actually dropped the recommendation to add vancomycin. Uh, Fraser Health is one of those. So not that we're making widespread decisions right during this during this time, but I just it raises the question of what really is the value and, and do we need it, right? So that's a positive note. So that's strep decoccus pneumoniae. Now let's move on to MRSA. I, I do have this under the good category. It's good, a little bit bad. We'll talk about it. So percentage of staph aureus isolates that are MRSA. So out of all of your staph aureus, what percentage is MRSA? So what I decided to do was to look back over the last like nine, 10 years and see, okay, what is the trend that we're seeing? I pulled our, our antibiograms. I think they were from 2015 to see what sort of trends we're seeing. So if you look at our adult outpatient non-urine, so this would be a, this is a community population, non-urinary isolate. So it could be bloodstream, could be tissue sample, um, abscess aspirate. In 2014, we sat at around 28%. So out of all of our staph aureus that we saw, 28%, just about 30% were MRSA. Fast forward to 2023, we're really seeing the same. So community, we're not seeing a big change. I think that's a that's a win to me. That's a positive. If you look in the inpatient setting, so this is hospital acquired, we see a little bit more of a difference. So we're getting closer to 40%, sitting at 38%. I mean, that's to be expected. These are hospital acquired infections. We know that hospitalization is a risk factor for MRSA. This isn't all that surprising to me. So in the hospital setting, if you've got an MRSA infection, about in Saskatoon anyway, about 40% of the time, it's going to be MRSA. If you look at bloodstream, though, um, bloodstream, we, we didn't have a bloodstream antibiogram back in 2015, so I, or 2014, so I can't compare. But this year, we were up to 45%. So that's nearly, like, if you're thinking in terms of simple math, that's like, there's like a 50-50 chance if you have a patient with a staph aureus bacteremia in Saskatoon, I can't speak for anywhere else, but we'll talk about that in a second, there's about a 50-50 chance that it's MRSA. When I looked across the other antibiograms across other areas, um, of course, this is all pooled data. We don't have the individual antibiograms from other areas. Um, Regina's was, the percent MRSA was 33%. So that's fairly comparable if you were to sort of combine our inpatient, outpatient, somewhere sitting between 31 and 38%. So Regina's was at 33%. So I would say that's comparable. Sunrise Health Region was 24%, a bit lower. And then Prairie North in 2020 was 34%. So I think we're probably seeing similar, if you were to really break things down, I think we would probably something see something similar across the province um, with maybe a little bit less in the South. Okay, I present this data just because I found it so interesting. It's not that clinically relevant, but I, I it was an interesting trend that we saw across basically all antibiograms, um, especially in, in the adult, um, uh, across the adult antibiograms. So we have pushed the message for years that our, like our clindamycin susceptibilities to MRSA have been really low, 60 to 70%. So we have pushed the message and educated for an empiric community acquired infection, if you're concerned about MRSA for say like a skin and soft tissue infection, clindamycin is a poor choice. You've got better options being probably septra and doxy, okay? Because our, our susceptibility rates were so low and uh, septra and doxy nears, you know, 100% susceptibility, 90 to 100%. So we've pushed that messaging for years. So interestingly, 2022 is at the bottom here. This is a community acquired non-urinary sample. Um, so in, in 2022, 74% um, was susceptible. So this is clindamycin here. 74% was susceptible to clindamycin. And then in 2023, we saw an increase to 81%. Okay, that's one antibiogram. What did we see across other antibiograms? This is now hospital, um, so inpatient non-urinary. 
we went from 65% susceptibility up to 82%. And this is a large sample size. We're looking at, you know, about 300 samples. So that's inpatient hospitalized non-urine. Inpatient bloodstream, not that you would ever use clindamycin for a bloodstream, or it certainly wouldn't be your first choice, second choice, or probably third choice. 61% was susceptible to clindamycin. 83% in this year was susceptible. Critical care population, 66. We've got a low sample size here, but 66% to 82%. And, and so we really saw this trend across all the antibiograms and it was just interesting and it almost kind of reinforces the idea. I, I can't say for sure this is why, but it kind of reinforces the idea that if, if you reduce the use of clindamycin or reduce the use of an antibiotic, you will see your susceptibilities grow. That's me hypothesizing. I have no idea why we're seeing this, but we really have pushed that messaging for years to not use clindamycin. And we really use very little clindamycin here in Saskatoon. So I wonder if that's the reason why. I have no other explanation as to why we double checked with microbiology that, you know, that we weren't missing something. And it's it's just an interesting fact to report. Um, not sure why, but um, we did see an increase in clinical susceptibilities. Not that clinically relevant, but but interesting none, nonetheless. Okay, now we're going to move on to some mostly bad trends. Let's start off with VRE. So VRE is uh, our vancomycin resistant enterococci. So what I looked at, I did a similar thing to what I did with MRSAs. So out of all of our enterococcus samples, what percentage of those are vancomycin resistant enterococci? And how has that changed over the last nine, 10 years? So in the community, so this is outpatient non-urine, in 2014, we sat around 17% is what we were reported at that time. And now fast forward to 2022, 2023, we're sitting closer to 50%. So a significant increase even in the community setting. And these are non-urine samples. In the inpatient setting, we used to be sitting around 38%, and now we're up to 62%. So out of all of the enterococci that we see, 62% of those are vancomycin resistant. In the bloodstream, we see the same thing. So this, the bloodstream um, antibiogram is obviously like a subset of our inpatient non-urine. So 62% we saw there. And in the critical care population in 2022, we saw 70%. Um, this year, we saw 61%. I suspect that that's not really an improvement, more of just a, a fluctuation. So we're seeing increasing rates of VRE kind of a, across the spectrum. Now, urine. I'm going to bring urine in here. We usually don't care that much about enterococcus in the urine. Often, it's representative of asymptomatic bacteria. It might be representative of, of colonization of the catheter, but I bring it up because we know this with asymptomatic bacteria, when people see bugs in the urine, they want to treat them. When people see scary bugs in the urine, they want to treat them even more. And so this is something that we are seeing in the community. 37% of urine samples that have enterococcus are VRE. And in the inpatient setting, even up to 66%. And I, I feel this all the time. When in Saskatoon, our our sort of VRE agents are restricted to infectious diseases only. And so in order to prescribe them, they have to call an infectious disease practitioner. Um, and when they, we have weeks now where we have no ID coverage and those calls often come to me and on a week when there is no ID, I get several calls with people wanting to treat VRE in the urine. And the question is always, are they symptomatic? Sometimes they are and it does need to be treated, but often they aren't. And so this, I raise this as a point of this is requires a lot of education and um, people are going to see it and people do want to treat it because VRE is scary, right? So VRE is increasing. We're going to see it across community, inpatient, urine, bloodstream, across the board. Okay, let's now move on to some gram negative agents. So let's uh, talk about ESBL or extended, extended spectrum beta lactams. 
or beta lactam bases rather. Um, again, I looked at percentage of uh, ESBL. So our, you know, we looked, we kind of have our four organisms that are more, most likely to produce ESBL, our E. coli, Club pneumo, um, Klebs oxytoca, and Proteus mirabilis. So out of all the samples from those organisms, what percentage of those are ESBLs? So in our outpatient, so this is a community non-urine. Um, in 2014, we sat around 5%. 2023, not that big of a change. We're seeing a bit of an increase, but in the community setting, um, not, not that large of an increase. In our inpatient setting, we see a bit more of a, not drastic, but we're definitely seeing higher rates. So um, sat around 5% in 2014, fast forward to 2023, and we're more like nine, maybe 10% looking at that 2022 data. So about one in 10 um, samples from a non-urine sample is going to be uh, an ESBL producing, producing organism, if it is E. coli, Club pneumo, Proteus, um, um, and Club, Club oxytoca. And then when we look at the bloodstream samples, this is, I believe it was 111 samples that we had. So we pooled all of um, those four organisms in our bloodstream samples and 18% last year was 24%, 18% of those were ESBL producers. So, you know, we often think, you know, our counterparts down below us have a lot more gram negative resistance than we do. And that certainly is true. I do wonder if we're, you know, starting to see the signal, um, especially I'll talk about some, some more gram negative stuff coming up here. I do wonder if this is, you know, we're starting to see the signal of more ESBLs, more gram negative resistance. Um, we're only going to see more of it and, and, and it's here to say, stay. And I, we are seeing it. It's, it's, it's on, it's on the slide. Looking more closely at E. coli specifically, I wanted to bring in some data about um, some, you know, com community thoughts around urinary tract infections. So I pulled in some of, some of our urine antibiograms. So this is 2022 compared to 2023 again. And um, here on the slide, you can um, see our susceptibility rates. I apologize, it's small, but hopefully um, I won't lose you here. So. Our Amox club holds steady. We sit at about 87% susceptibility for an E. coli in the urine in, in the community setting. Uh, Cipro, no, no surprise because we use it so much. Susceptibilities are lower, sitting at around 71%. And Septra, 78%, not terrible, not great. Nitrofurantoin remains good at 97%, but we obviously know if you've got, you know, a febrile UTI or um, involving the upper urinary tract, nitrofurantoin wouldn't be your agent of choice. So not, not terrible. We're starting to see some, some resistance here, but nothing, nothing super, super shocking really. In patients, so this would be a hospitalized urinary tract infection. Obviously we're going to see a little bit more resistance. Amox club continues to hold its own above 80%. Cipro, 64% would probably not be a great empiric choice. Septra, uh, 75%. And again, nitrofurantoin holds its own at 96. So if you're looking at an oral option, um, Amox club would probably be your best option, nitrofurantoin, if it's if it's a lower urinary tract infection. Of course, keeping in mind this is Saskatoon data. In, uh, so E. coli from an inpatient bloodstream perspective. So here you can see Septrax, and this would be res reflective of our, our ESBL rates um, for E. coli. But then I, I just pulled in even our, our Cipro susceptibilities for bloodstream, you know, 58% to 61. So we're sitting around that 60% mark. Um, that's not good at all. Our carbapenems are great, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, we are starting to see some, some resistance here as well. Okay. Long-term urine, long-term care urine, hold on to your socks for this one. So not good as, um, I, I don't think anyone's really surprised, but when you look at E. coli, cause that's our number one cause of a urinary tract infection, we've got 504 samples here, looking at our oral options. Um, for long-term care, amoxclav sits below 80% at 73. And really that's, if you're looking at a upper urinary tract infection, that's the, the best you're going to get for an oral option. Ciprofloxacin is a whopping 42%. That's obviously not great. 
Uh, SEPTRA is at 67%, and nitrofurantoin is um, the best option if it's the lower urinary tract infection at 88%. Your phospho over here, I believe, is 96%. Um, so, yeah, I think that treating urinary tract infections in the long term care setting is going to be difficult, especially with limiting. Um, our oral options and empiric, like uh, your best choice, I suppose, a mox clove. And even then, you're, you know, you're looking at a 27% chance that it's not susceptible. So that's not great. Um, yeah. Okay, couple more gram negatives. Um, and then I feel like I had something else I wanted to say on this, and now it has escaped me, but that's okay. I think of it, I'll come back to it. Okay, one, two more gram negatives, and then I will pass the ball over to Jason. Um, Enterobacter cloacae. So we saw something, a bit of a trend starting this year with um, our Enterobacter cloacae. So if you recall, Enterobacter cloacae is one of those AMPC producing organisms. So typically, if you have a serious infection, such as a bloodstream infection, um, you would use a carbapenem until you have susceptibilities to prove that you could use something else such as um, ciprofloxacin, for example. Um, in the antimicrobial stewardship world, when you're looking across your carbapenems, you, ertapenem compared to meropenem, ertapenem is a bit of a win because it doesn't have your anti-pseudomonal coverage. So it's a bit more narrow spectrum than meropenem. So uh, we used to, and we do still use a lot of ertapenem here in Saskatoon. And, Again, maybe this is reflective of maybe these susceptibilities are reflective of that. So if you look at this is inpatient non urine, so this would include bloodstream. So this year we saw from our susceptibilities go from 88% to 77%. Miro obviously continues to um, hold its own there. And we saw that also in our urine samples as well. Not that you would need to necessarily always jump to a carbapenem for a urine sample, but I pulled this in here just to show the susceptibilities. So 77% um, down to 70%. So that's a bit unfortunate because from an antimicrobial steward pers um, perspective, I often would use ertapenem um, empirically um, to treat uh, an enterobacter cloacae bloodstream infection because our susceptibility rates were quite good. Now, I don't know that I would trust that if we're sitting at 77%. So, something to be mindful of here in Saskatoon anyway. Okay, finishing with a bang is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So, over the last couple of years, we have noticed uh, a fairly significant trend, particularly among like our most vulnerable population, so our ICU population and um, sort of our, our rest population. So the first antibiogram I'm going to pull up here is our adult ICU non-urine. So this would be um, bacteremias, um, rest samples, um, et cetera. So at the bottom is 2022. And I apologize, this is small, but the colors really do speak for themselves here. So in 2022, um, Smaller sample size, keep that in mind. Um, in 2022, like really, this was horrific. Like our PIPTAS susceptibility was 66%, ceftazidine was 68, meropenem was 64, six, ciprofloxacin was 75, leaving tobramycin really and truly our best agent. This year, we did see an improvement, smaller sample size. So I'm taking this with a grain of salt. I think that our sample, our susceptibility rates are, are still not great, but PIPTAS, 76%, still not great. Meropenem, 79%, and ciprofloxacin, 76%. Ceftazidime improved significantly. I don't know why. Um, and tobramycin at 97%. So this was alarming to us when we first saw this last year. Um, we are definitely seeing increasing rates of resistance among pseudomonas. When you look at our rest samples, it tells a very similar story. So higher sample size here, um, we, we went from 70% to 74% for Tazacin, 74 to 78 for Ceftaz, 77 to 78 for Miro, 
71 to 69% for Cipro, again, leaving our aminoglycoside as really the best option. And that's kind of scary. So I don't like to be doom and gloom. And this is, you know, Saskatoon data and very specific data looking at our most vulnerable populations, but we are seeing high rates of high rates of resistance among among these populations. Okay, that concludes um, my portion. Um, to summarize, we are seeing increasing rates of ESBL, MRSA, VRE isolates, and VRE appears to be winning in, in, a, in a bad way. We are seeing gram-negative resistance increasing, particularly in Saskatoon, among Pseudomonas rutinosa isolates in those most vulnerable populations. Some positives, we saw that increase in clindamycin susceptibility that might just be a signal to us that, you know, if we can reduce the use of something, it will flourish once again at some point. Um, and outpatient management of UTIs in the long-term care setting, I think will be challenging. So, oh, I remember what I wanted to say. So we need to keep fighting the good fight in not treating asymptomatic bacteria in the long-term care population because I think that the management will become very difficult um, as time goes on. So with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen. I'll pass over to Jason. Um, I don't know, do we do want to do questions now or at the end, or how do you want to? Why don't I, you know, I'll run through this quickly and then uh, we'll we'll save room for questions at the end then. Um, and then that way we can combine them all together. Sure. Um, so let me just thank you for that. Um, hopefully people have had a moment to put their socks back on so I can now blow them off with something really cool coming from the uh, national world. So hopefully you're all seeing that. Okay. Um, so to kind of uh, dovetail off of uh, what Danielle took us through there with uh, antibiograms. So one of the things we want to be able to do is um, one have easier access to creating these uh, these documents or, or curating this information um, across the province. Um, but also nationally, this is something that's important for us to understand from a from a surveillance perspective. What rates of resistance look like across the country, and where there are hot spots that that are ripe for intervention. So, um, I'm just going to present a few slide, present a few slides here quickly, um, and I will just say I uh, can only take partial credit for this. So, I reached out to Wallace uh, Rudnick at the um, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, and she provided me with a bunch of slides that she had presented just a couple months ago about AMR Net, uh, this thing that they have been working on for uh, a few years now. So. Uh, just to set the stage for everyone, we have a pan-Canadian action plan on antimicrobial resistance, the PCAP, you may have heard of it. Uh, one of those, uh, or the, the main piece of this is, is these five pillars of action um, that they've got in, built into that. And one of the big pieces uh, around that is surveillance. And so this is where antibiograms are an important piece and, and you know, understanding what type of uh, infections and resistance we're seeing across the country um, is an important piece of this action plan. So uh, CINFI, the Canadian Network for Public Health Intelligence, um, is one of these arms of the public health agency. Um, I do not work for any of these organizations, so I'm simply presenting this data or this information sort of on their behalf. But uh, basically what you've got here is uh, one of the most important pieces that they do is uh, provide surveillance and laboratory support. So you can see just from the blue piece there, uh, they've got 40 purpose-built technologies that support data collection, analysis, and intelligence generation and dissemination. Uh, so they're an important partner um, in public health work, um, and they are the ones that are driving this AMR net. Um, so what this is, is basically a lab-based AMR surveillance program. It's still under development, um, but something that uh, is already showing where it could be useful. Uh, it's a collaborative effort between PHAC, the Provincial Territorial Public Health, and Human and Animal Laboratories across Canada. So really trying to take this one health approach to AMR surveillance. It's not just a human thing, but we're looking at these other pieces as well. Uh, they're trying to capture the existing information on clinical antimicrobial susceptibility testing from lab information systems in clinical well laboratories and animal laboratories. Um, and it uh, is the idea here is that they're building a flexible system that can be expanded in the future to include uh, human and animal antimicrobial use, uh, information from agri-food sector, wastewater, things like that. So really trying to build a platform on which we can expand and have multiple uses for uh, over the years. 
The objectives right now are to integrate the monitoring of trends and rates of AMR across humans, animals, nationally, regionally, locally. So getting big information from that national level right down to something that's locally relevant as well. Uh, hopefully this will allow us to detect the emergence and spread of AMR in Canada and disseminate timely information. Uh, it is also a piece of us fulfilling, uh, Canada fulfilling our, our commitment to the WHO's uh, GLASS initiative, this Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System. Uh, hopefully this will be able to support research and innovation on AMR and uh, to build antimicrobial stewardship capacity at provincial, territorial and local public health levels. So the minimum data that they capture, so first there's their inclusion criteria, all clinical antimicrobial susceptibility results from all bacterial and fungal uh, pathogens are captured. Uh, they identify and hopefully remove duplicates uh, based on CLSI recommendations. And then the uh, screening specimens are identified and removed if possible. And so you can see there from the human and animal world, there's some of those minimum criteria. So age groups uh, for people, age groups, gender, uh, the forward sortation area, so that FSA where you are located in the country based on your postal code, uh, inpatient versus outpatient, so on and so forth. Um, who is con currently contributing? Uh, so you can see the any of the green provinces and territories there are those that are currently submitting data, um, and it gives you an approximate percentage of how much of their data and from what sources. So there in Saskatchewan, 75 to 90 percent of our uh, human in and outpatient data are being submitted, and more than 95 percent of all of our animal data are being submitted to this database. So this is what it looks like if you if you can get an account um, and log into the AMR net, it pulls up this dashboard. And so I've just taken a few screenshots that can show you what that is. So basically you can start selecting different uh, specimen types or the jurisdiction, the area you are in the, the country, human, animal data, all those kinds of things um, to really start to pick out just the pieces that you might want to look at. And then it can pull up sort of an antibiogram, something that might look like this. Um, and something that you might be more familiar with. So they have just different options up there right now as they're sorting out what this will look like in the end. This is something like you just saw from what Danielle was showing, uh, more similar to what we've been using in Saskatchewan. Uh, this one just uses the size of the circle to represent the amount of resistance that you see or susceptibility. But you'll see stuff like this. It'll give you for whatever pieces you've chosen in, in those uh, up here. It'll spit out your antibiogram down below to give you the specific information. Uh, and then you can even go into further detail. So you can specify which organism or uh, antibiotic for a detailed view, and it'll give you national views, 10 year trends. So it'll pull up a map and it'll show you different resistance patterns and stuff like that. Again, depending on where you want to look, um, and you can sort of dig down into FSAs and things like that from there. Uh, and then it'll show graphs because again, looking at trends, and that's kind of what Danielle was showing, right? Looking at trends is a great way to look at this data to see if we're seeing increases or decreases or no change over time to know where we have uh, possible room for uh, intervention. And you can break down by the province and territories or different other data categories for animals, environment, food, things like that. So uh, what does it all mean? Why does Jason think this is cool? Um, from a data perspective, this is super useful. So AMRNet, sitting in the center of this Venn diagram here. One thing we can use this for is research. So we can compare AMR rates or trends across Canada by seeing more and more data get put into this beast. It becomes a hypothesis generator. There's so much work that can come from this. Um, so it's gonna be, I think, something super useful. Uh, again, from that surveillance perspective. So again, being able to compare AMR rates and trends across Canada is something very useful for us to know where we need to be uh, working at things. And again, identifying those hotspots or populations of interest that, that might need uh, intervention sooner than later sort of thing. And then of course, from a clinical perspective, all of these data can feed into our antibiograms and provide timely local antibiogram data. So rather than, you know, someone like Danielle or the folks in our lab having to go through every year and sort through all this data, uh, we should be able to set up automatic data pulls from this that it can refresh our antibiograms, perhaps on a monthly basis or every six months, or even if it's still just annually um, getting that new data built into something like first line. Um, so that's available uh, updated data for clinicians to use uh, in those antibiograms. Uh, so just a couple of acknowledgements again, Wallace prepared most of these slides, so I just want to thank her for uh, sharing them with me. And then there's some members of uh, the team there that are working on AMRNet. Um, and I do just want to give a shout out to you for uh, the, the uh, in memoriam that Wallace had uh, submitted here. So Dr. Mike Mulvey, um, who I 
didn't work very closely with, but was able to have a couple meetings with him and always struck me as a uh, wonderful and brilliant human being. Um, he uh, passed away just recently. And so I just want to say that, you know, thank you to him for being one of the leads in developing this AMR net. So um, he's been a great force for lots of things in the uh, public health world. Uh, but that's AMR net in a nutshell. So I will stop sharing and we can go back to the main piece here. Um, let me just, uh, well, let me say first, thank you, Danielle, for uh, sharing all the antibiogram information. And I see you're able to put some stuff in the chat there, but um, I'm going to stop recording.